Meine Damen und Herren, hallo und herzlich willkommen. Mein Name ist James Fram. Ich bin Professor für Deutsch am Ethical College. Ich lebe in New York. Es ist wunderbar, dass Sie da sind. So then, or as we say in German, also dann. For many of you, that was probably your first real taste of German. For others, maybe it was a reminder of the German you learned way back when, but have since forgotten. Either way, I bet you can already understand some of what I said. Here it is again. Meine Damen und Herren, hallo und herzlich willkommen. Mein Name is James Frem. Ich bin Professor für Deutsch am Ithaca College. Ich lebe in New York. Es ist wunderbar, dass Sie da sind. And now, here's the whole thing, one last time. And this time, just listen and let the beautiful sounds of German flow over you. Meine Damen und Herren, hallo und herzlich willkommen. Mein Name ist James Frem. Ich bin Professor für Deutsch am Ithaca College. Ich lebe in New York. Es ist wunderbar, dass Sie da sind. Great! Or, as we say auf Deutsch in German, großartig. Also dann. And now let me welcome you again to this, the first step in our journey through the German language. By journey's end, we'll have all the tools we need to use and understand basic German from its sounds and grammatical structures to the peoples and places that have made German the culturally vibrant language that it is today. Notice that I keep using the word journey instead of course or class. Well, that's because over the years, I've come to believe that learning a foreign language really is a journey. I mean, think about it. A journey has twists and turns, milestones and mistakes. And most of all, journeys are full of surprises. Well, guess what? That's also what it's like to learn a new language. And so I've planned our journey here with two goals in mind. First, we are going to get a comprehensive grounding in how the German language works, its sounds, its words, and of course, its fascinating grammar. Ja, das ist richtig. That's right. I just use the adjective fascinating to describe German's grammar. Because maybe, just maybe, some of you are like me. For one reason or another, we just enjoy conjugational endings and word inflections. And so, if you are a fellow grammarphile, you are in the right place. Because in our journey here, we're going to learn all of German's grammatical cases, its moods, its aspects, and most of its verbal tenses. By the same token, though, if you're someone who finds less enjoyment in grammar, or if you've ever heard someone else say that German grammar is really hard or hopelessly difficult. Well, let me assure you, with me as your guide, your encounters here with the German grammar won't be daunting. We're going to discover it bit by bit, with clear explanations, plenty of examples in both German and English, and always, always within a functional context. By which I mean that I'm going to work all this fascinating grammar into engaging exercises that also teach you key aspects of pronunciation, vocabulary, and culture. Alles klar? For the record, we will see quite a few tables showing inflectional endings and conjugational forms. After all, this is German we're talking about. And these visuals, believe it or not, really are helpful at times. Aber keine Panik! our journey won't be cluttered by dozens and dozens of complicated charts and diagrams. Which actually brings me to our second goal. As your personal guide, I'm going to make sure that you get all this great content in a way that echoes the unpredictable and exciting journey of learning a language in a natural setting. Let me show you what I mean. Los geht's! And just like that, we are off to Witznau, Switzerland, for a tour of the Rigi. The Rigi is a mountain massif in the Central Alps. We climb aboard the Zahnrad Bergbahn. This is the oldest mountain railway in Europe. It takes us 1,800 meters up to Rigi's highest peak, Kolm. And we stand there in awe, taking in the valleys and lakes below, when a gentleman 
and his wife approach us, camera in hand, and begin talking. Entschuldigung, können Sie bitte ein Foto von uns machen? Gerne. Drei, zwei, eins. Vielen Dank. Bitte sehr. Diese Aussicht ist schön, oder? Ja, sehr schön. Woher sind Sie, wenn ich fragen darf? Ich komme aus den USA. Sie sprechen aber gut Deutsch. Danke. Ich lerne Deutsch gern. Und woher sind Sie? Wir sind aus Deutschland. Wir wohnen in Augsburg. Ach so. Und wo ist Augsburg? And the next thing you know, Ralf und Mia are insisting that we come visit them in their home city of Augsburg. Schön, oder? Also dann. That little episode should give you an idea of what I mean when I say that on our journey here, we're going to get to know the language through real-world contexts, and not just through grammar tables, translation activities, and repeat-after-me exercises. Alles klar? Großartig! And this brings me to one last important note about our journey. If you haven't already noticed, this is not going to be one of those language learning deals that promises you a full immersion experience or that tries to mimic the natural processes of child language acquisition. Warum nicht? Well, first of all, we are not children. In fact, if you think about it, it's kind of odd, maybe even borderline patronizing, to treat someone like a child when they're trying to accomplish something as difficult as learning a new language. And second, unlike a child, we're not passively acquiring a first language. We're adults, and we're actively learning a foreign language. So what I'm getting at is this. Your journey here with me will be 30 straightforward and hopefully entertaining lessons each one created for the purpose of showing you this is the German language and this is how you use it. I'm going to explain the language to you. I'm not just going to bombard you with it and expect that somehow, miraculously, you soak it up like a child. Alles klar? Alrighty then. Are you ready for our journey to begin? Are you ready to start learning German? Großartig! Also dann, meine Damen und Herren, los geht's! We're going to jump right in with some basics on pronunciation. In German, by the way, the word for pronunciation is die Aussprache. Oh, and also, don't forget that this is a video. So you can pause or rewind me as many times as you want or you can stand. <laughs> What we want to do is get our mouth used to forming all these new sounds. And we can do this by forming the sounds again and again. So think of it as training your oral muscle memory. Alles klar? Which now brings me to my second tip. Practice your pronunciation in a mirror. In a mirror, you can actually see what's going on in your mouth, with your lips, tongue, teeth, and throat. You know, I always tell my students to prepare themselves because in my course, they're also going to get to know their mouth better. Also dann. Here's our first phrase. Guten Tag. It's the most important greeting in German. Guten Tag. It works in all German-speaking areas in the morning and afternoon. Listen especially to the vowel in the first word. Guten Tag. You'll notice that the U sound in Guten is deeper and has a purer tone than English's U. The German U requires your lips to stay rounded while your tongue rises and bunches up against the roof of your mouth towards the back. U. Guten, guten Tag. Imagine that we're walking into a museum in Hamburg. How do we greet the person at the ticket counter? Guten Tag. Now, picture us going to this museum first thing in the morning. Guten Tag will work fine, but we can also say Guten Morgen. And now repeat after me. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. And now, imagine that we're in the beautiful harbor city of Bremen. It's eight in the morning, and we walk into a Bäckerei. How do we greet the baker? Guten Morgen. And then, when it's evening time, well, we can wish the baker Guten Abend. Wiederholen Sie bitte. This phrase means, please repeat, by the way. Wiederholen Sie bitte. 
You'll hear me say it a lot throughout our journey. So then, wiederholen Sie bitte. Guten Abend. And now, picture us walking up to a discotheque in Düsseldorf. Because, well, we're never too old to dance in Düsseldorf, right? And when the bouncer looks at us, we say, Guten Abend. The bouncer, by the way, that's what we call der Türsteher, which literally translates to door stander. Tür, meaning door, steher, means stander. Now, one of the things we'll see again and again on our journey is that German is a compound-friendly language. It just loves to stick words and pieces of words together to make a new word. So, take the German word for refrigerator. That word is Kühlschrank, literally, cool cupboard. The word for mitten is Handschuh, a hand shoe. And one of my personal favorite German compounds, are you ready, is Wiederbelebungsversuche. Now, you translate this as resuscitation attempts, you know, in the sense of doing CPR on someone. But the word itself is actually made up of three smaller words, Wieder, Belebung, and Versuche. Vida means again. Belebung literally means be lifing, as in to give someone the attribute of aliveness. And versuche is attempts. So this fantastic word, wiederbelebungsversuche, really means attempts to bring to life again. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? So let's get back to the Aussprache. So far, we've learned standard greetings for all the times of day, and the German vowel U. Guten Morgen, Guten Tag, Guten Abend. But we need to add something else here. You see, in most countries around the world, there are different greetings depending on where you live. Now, if you're familiar with the United States, think of howdy y'all in some parts of the U.S. South. And well, the same thing applies in the German-speaking world. In southern Germany and in Austria, for instance, Speakers prefer to use another phrase for when they greet each other. And this phrase is Grüß Gott. Wiederholen Sie bitte. Grüß Gott. Grüß Gott. Imagine us taking a seat in a Wiener Café house, a Viennese café. And when the waiter approaches, we say Grüß Gott. Listen closely to the vowel in Grüß. Now, this is not a vowel we have in English. In German, it's written as a U with two little dots over it, called an umlaut. In fact, you've probably seen this pair of dots before, especially if you're a fan of the 80s hair band Motley Crue or if you fancy haagen ice cream. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but those umlauts have nothing to do with the German umlaut, well, at least not in the sense of sound. The umlaut in German actually means that the U is more front tonguey. Now, what I mean by front tonguey is that the vowel, U, is pronounced with your lips in the usual rounded position, but your tongue moves forward. So, say U, and now keep your lips rounded, but unbunch the tongue from the back of your mouth and move it slowly forward along the upper palate. In fact, put it in the same place as you do for the vowel, E. And now, pronounce the U, keeping your tongue where you would for the E. U, U. That's it. Wiederholen Sie bitte. Grüß, Grüß Gott. We'll meet another umlauted vowel in our next lesson. Also dann, meine Damen und Herren, now that we've learned a few ways to greet someone auf Deutsch, let's learn how to say goodbye. And the first option is one that you might have heard before. Auf Wiedersehen. Note that Wiedersehen is spelled with a W. But like all German words spelled with a W, it's pronounced as a V. Wiederholen Sie bitte. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. So, imagine once again that we're strolling into that Bäckerei in Bremen. How do we greet the baker? Guten Morgen. Or, Guten Tag. And then, after we bought a loaf of frisches Brot, we say, Auf Wiedersehen. But then, 
what do we say at night when we part ways with our dinner guests after a lovely rounded meal of Bier, Sauerkraut, and Bratwurst? Well, we wish them Gute Nacht. Also dann, meine Damen und Herren, wiederholen Sie bitte. Gute Nacht. Gute Nacht. Whoa, there it is. Did you hear it? Ladies and gentlemen, we just encountered the most famous of German sounds, the ch. Now, quick trivia question for you. Who was that masterful German composer of the Baroque period? You might recall his Toccata and Fugue in D minor goes like this. Da na na, da na 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 na. You got it. That's the one, the only, Johann Sebastian Bach. Now, we say Bach in English. But you'll note that his name is spelled B-A-C-H. And in German, if a C-H comes after an A ah sound, it's pronounced H. So it's Bach. It's not Bach. Bach is actually a multi-style of German beer. Yum. We'll hear all about Deutsches Bier in another lesson. But for now, and for Johann Sebastian, while I guess you can sip a Bock Bier while taking in one of Johann's Meisterwerke, just remember, you're listening to Bach, not Bach. Also dann, wiederholen Sie bitte, Bach. The tongue bunches up in the back of the mouth, and air gets pushed out and over it. The result is a low, raspy sound, ch. Now you try it. Bach. Nacht. Bach. Gute Nacht, Bach. Okay, so this is where I have to point out one unfortunate ambiguity in German spelling. German spelling is actually really consistent, and we'll see this in our next lesson, in fact, when we cover the alphabet in more detail. The ambiguity I want to point out now has to do with the CH spelling, just as we saw it in words like Nacht and Bach. Now, we just saw that this sound is pronounced in the back of the throat as ch. Well, the CH can also stand for another sound, which is pronounced near the front of the mouth, and this sound is ch. Let me show you what I mean using a phrase that I believe everyone should know in German. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Now, this phrase has three instances of the hier sound. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. It means I speak a little German. And if you say the phrase right, you'll feel your tongue flatten up against the roof of the mouth, towards the front and not the back. So with Bach, it was in the back. Nacht, it was in the back. This sound, is in the front. So here's that phrase one more time. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. Don't worry if you struggle with this sound. Um, I can tell you that it usually takes my students a while to get it. But one tip I can give you is to point out that English does, in fact, have a similar sound. Now, it only occurs in certain sound environments, but our English-speaking mouth does produce it let me show you. Check out this name in English. Hugh. Now, say it aloud yourself. Hugh. Do you hear the soft, hissy sound? At least when I say the H and the U sounds together. Shh. There it is. Now that sound is fairly close to German H. Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. All right then, meine Damen und Herren, it's time to put it all together, all the phrases we've learned so far. And here's the scenario that's going to help us do it. Imagine it's a warm summer day in München. That's Munich. And we've just been the entire afternoon visiting a few of its incredible museums. Now, understandably, we've worked up quite a thirst. Keine Panik. Just so happens that München has about 200 Biergärten. So we walk up to a friendly-looking pedestrian and we say, Guten Tag, wo ist dein Biergarten? To which the friendly-looking pedestrian replies, Na ja, ich meine, es gibt einen tollen Biergarten gleich hier um die Ecke. Whoa, that's way more German than we can handle at this point in our journey. So we use the phrase we've just learned. 
Ich spreche ein bisschen Deutsch. And upon hearing this, the friendly looking pedestrian takes out their smartphone and shows us that, amazingly, there's a beer garden just around the next corner. Großartig, we exclaim, and then we wish them Auf Wiedersehen. And like that, we're on our way to a Munich beer garden to slake our thirst. Ach, beer. Now, give yourself a little pat on the back because you've officially taken the first steps in your journey to learn German. Also dann, meine Damen und Herren, I hope that you enjoyed this little introduction to some of German's distinct sounds and the handful of useful phrases, too. Right now, however, I'd like to let you in on a lesser known secret about you and me and anyone else who knows English, whether as a native speaker or an advanced learner. And here's the secret. Speakers of English are intrinsically suited to learn German. Wie bitte? What's that, you ask? Yes, you heard me right. Das ist richtig. English and German are what linguists call sister languages. If we went back in time, we'd see that English and German come from the same parent language. And so today, they have a lot of words and even a lot of grammar in common. So let me show you what I mean. Here is another short paragraph about myself. And it's all in German. And I'll bet that you are able to understand much, if not all of it. Here goes. Hallo, mein Name ist James. Ich komme aus Oregon. Ich habe einen jüngeren und einen älteren Bruder. Meine Eltern haben ein Haus in Oregon. Meine Mutter geht oft in gute Restaurants. Mein Vater liebt Hunde. You were able to understand a lot of that, am I right? And the reason for this is simple. You know English. So let's take one more look at what I just said. My name is James. My name is James. That's pretty straightforward. Ich komme. I come. Aus. Out of or from. Oregon. Ich komme aus Oregon. I come from Oregon. The English cognates for kommen and aus are to come and out. But you also heard me use the words Bruder, Mutter, Vater, Haus, and Restaurants. I'm sure you can come up with English cognates for those, right? Now, sometimes we do have to reach a little to find cognates. The word Hunde, for example. Well, Hunde is actually a cognate with the English word hounds, but not in the sense of the particular breed, but rather all canines in general, that is, dogs. So let's try one together. Another word you heard me use was oft. Now, what do you think the English cognate is of oft? Richtig, often. And I also said the word liebt, liebt. If you guessed that it's cognate with English loves, you're right on the money. Elsewhere in my monologue, I talked about my Elton. Elton. Do you have any idea what the English cognate for that might be? I mean, it's translated as parents, but that word parents was borrowed from French a long time ago. Elton. Okay, this one is a little tough. Elton is actually cognate with our word elders. Do you see the connection? Those who are älter or older are also our elders. Elton. Pretty cool, right? And so my point is this. English and German are close linguistic relatives. If you or anyone else knows enough English to understand this lesson, well, then you're in luck because you already have a head start on learning German. And speaking of learning German, why should you or anyone else learn it? Who speaks German and where do they speak it? You know, every semester I ask my students this same question. And I ask them, I say, why did you guys choose German from all the other languages that our college offers? And without fail, I get a list that looks something like this. I have family in Germany. German is important for international business. I'm going to travel to Germany. It's important for what I'm studying. My grandma used to swear at me in German. And finally, my advisor is making me take German. Aside from the last one, these are all great reasons to learn German. What's more, they suggest that German is an important and useful language today. 
For starters, it doesn't surprise me in the least that a lot of my students have memories of a family member swearing at them in German. On the 2010 census, around 50 million Americans listed German as their ancestry. Now, that's a whopping 15% of the entire U.S. population. And at the time of this taping, German ranks among the top five languages other than English spoken at home in the United States. And in 16 states, German is the third most frequently spoken language at home, after English and Spanish. Worldwide, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million people speak German as a first language, and more than 15 million speak it as a second language. When I talk to people about what I do, many of them are pretty surprised when I tell them that, you know, German is spoken in a lot more places than Germany. Actually, I tell them, German is listed as an official language in six countries. And in another 13 countries, German is recognized as an official minority language. In fact, the German language has a bigger international presence than many people realize. In terms of business and finance, it's well known that Germany's economy drives the European Union. German, Austrian, and Swiss companies employ millions of people, both at home and overseas. And you might have heard of some of these companies. Mercedes, Siemens, Red Bull, Glock, Nestle, Rolex. Sound familiar? Finally, as most of you already know, German is also an internationally acknowledged language of culture and learning. Whether it's literature or politics, science or philosophy, music or history, some of the best and brightest minds have written in the German language. There's just way too many to name here. But I will tell you this much. By learning German, you are opening up an exclusive door to this trove of knowledge and beauty. Many of my own students have taken German from me because they want access to that exclusive higher level of learning. Now, I could go on and on with reasons to learn German, but what it really comes down to is this. You have to have your own reason. And it's got to be something that drives you deeply and personally, whether you're seeking closer connections to family, planning a trip to a German-speaking country, or because, like me, yes, I will admit it, like me, you just really dig grammar and words and foreign languages in general. Whatever it is, something should motivate you. The rest is my job. Also done, meine Damen und Herren, are you ready for your journey? Are you ready to learn the ins and outs of the German language and the German-speaking culture? Großartig! Los geht's! <laughs>